Okay, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second recovery task force meeting. Uh, many of you already met me the last time, my name, but just in case, um, my name is Aurelia Bailey, one of the community and economic recovery team member. But before we get started, I will actually be covering a few logistics for tonight's meeting. This meeting will include interpretation in Spanish and Vietnamese, thanks to our interpreters who's helping us for tonight's meeting. Um, to access the interpretation, click on the inter interpretation button on your Zoom screen. You could actually find that um, at the bottom of your screen and then select the appropriate language. We have two videos to show you and in, in Spanish and in Vietnamese that will explain the process. Hola y bienvenidos a esta reunión. Para acceder a la función de interpretación, haga clic en el icono del globo en la parte inferior de la ventana de Zoom y selecciona el idioma que desea. Para escuchar claramente el audio de interpretación, le recomendamos que también seleccione la opción para silenciar el audio original, que es la opción más baja en el menú después de hacer clic en el icono del globo. Xin chào và cảm ơn quý vị đã tham dự buổi họp ngày hôm nay. Để truy cập vào phần thông dịch của ứng dụng Zoom, xin nhấn vào biểu tượng hình quả địa cầu ở phía dưới của màn hình và chọn ngôn ngữ theo ý muốn của quý vị. Để nghe rõ lời phiên dịch, chúng tôi khuyến khích quý vị chọn chức năng tắt âm thanh góc nằm ở phía cuối trong phần tùy chọn của biểu tượng quả địa cầu. So we also have enabled the closed caption feature. And if you'd like to use it, please hit the live transcript that's also at the bottom of your screen. Um, just a few other logistics we'd like, just a few other logistics. We actually would like all the task force members to rename yourselves on Zoom. You guys did this the last time um, by adding your first and last name and the organization you represent. So, uh, so we can identify you as a task force member. To do that, all you have to do is two things, press your, or use your right click button or look, at, look for the three dots on your Zoom profile and then click on the three dots and rename yourself. Uh, don't forget to include your organizations, your organization's name. All task force members will actually have the opportunity to ask questions after each section. Um, in this case for tonight, um, our initiative leads will actually be presenting and the task force members will have the opportunity to have a Q&A after they present. We ask that for task force members to use your raise, raise your hand feature that is down below in your Zoom screen and your team, and our team member, Mike, will call your name so you can unmute yourself. This meeting is open to the public. Welcome and thank you for being here tonight. You will have the opportunity for two minutes to share your voice during the public comment portion of the agenda. This will happen toward the end. Until then, we appreciate your patience during the rest of the meeting. Just a reminder, make sure you mute yourself during this time and check on my end. So then I will pass it on to Rosalind. Great, thank you so much, Aurelia. And good evening, everyone. So good to see all of you. Again, my name is Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. Um, really good to be with you this evening and want to welcome all of the task force members and all of the members of the public who are participating tonight. 
Um, and before we get into the agenda, I just, just want to take a moment um, and like to start our meeting tonight acknowledging that we are on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people. We pay respect to their elders past and present, and we give thanks to their sacrifice and examples of humility, stewardship, and resilience. And so with that, we are going to jump right into the agenda. I'll do a quick review of what we're gonna be going over tonight. So if you could go to the next slide, great. Um, so as Aurelia mentioned, um, the main portion of our agenda tonight um, will be the presentations on the city roadmap recovery initiatives. And I'll do a quick refresher on what those recovery initiatives are. And then you'll be hearing from many of our uh, city staff members who are working on these items. Um, after that, we will do a quick review of our, our previous meeting. We'll review our group agreements to make sure that we have consensus on, on what we discussed last time around. And we'll also provide some general updates, um, including uh, the process for establishing committees uh, and, and would like to get your feedback on that. Then after that, of course, we'll have public comment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about next steps and we'll adjourn our meeting for tonight. So next slide. So I, at the last meeting, I um, went over uh, this city, the city of San Jose roadmap, which our city council approved in March um, of this year. And really this roadmap is a framework for prioritizing um, really significant big change initiatives in the city. So these are items that are in addition to the regular uh, city services that our um, departments deliver every day. Um, and as you recall, there are 41 um, different initiatives on this chart, um, and many of them are related to recovery. And so the, the roadmap is organized by enterprise priorities, and we have eight of those. Those are shown um, in the column to the left in gray. And then you can see that the very first enterprise priority and then the row, the first row is all about the COVID-19 uh, community and economic recovery. So next slide. So here again is that first row highlighted. Um, and as you can see uh, on the far right, um, that last box is where you'll see the recovery task force. So that's how this body got formed. So that's that's where this group lives. And then the project items, the six items are the uh, recovery initiatives that are already ongoing. And so this evening, um, you're going to uh, receive presentations on each of these six items um, by our city initiative leads. Next slide. So with that, we're just gonna jump right into it. Um, the first item is on housing stabilization. Um, and I understand Reagan Henninger, uh, who is our deputy director of our housing department will lead us through this presentation. So I will turn it over to Reagan. Thanks, Lynn. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director of the City's Housing Department. And the department is lead for the Housing Stabilization Roadmap. And this is really the department's work on emergency rental assistance and our eviction prevention help centers. And this work was not only prioritized as part of the city's community and economic recovery, but council also prioritized it as part of the housing department's work on residential anti-displacement. Next slide. So by way of background in 2020, when the pandemic first hit uh, and in that subsequent year, we provided approximately 38 million in emergency rental assistance to 15,000 households. And the sources were local funds, 
Private Funds and CARES Act. And 77% of the households we served were extremely low income households, meaning at or below 30% of AM, AMI. And 94% were households of color. And about a quarter of the households we served were, were unable to access an online payment platform. So in-person assistance was really critical. And now in 2021 and 2022, we're focused on distributing approximately 123 million in US Treasury funds for rental assistance from the American Rescue Plan. We center this work in racial equity and community, meaning we are very targeted in reaching extremely low income households, in reaching households of color, in reaching households that are most vulnerable to displacement or homelessness if they lose their housing, and households that have been, that are in areas that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. So we do this by engaging the community through targeted rental assistance pop-up events throughout the city. And that is one of our um, OKRs that we're measuring is the number of events that we do in community. Second, we are partnering with local partners and the state to deploy direct financial assistance. And third, we're partnering with community organizations to provide residents with legal assistance, support, and mediation to prevent displacement. Next slide, please. So up until a few weeks ago, we were operating under a hybrid rental assistance model, meaning there was both a local rental assistance program and a state rental assistance program. Uh, but a few weeks ago, we made the shift to, to operate just one program at the state level. So the state program launched back in March. And since that time, uh, they have received just over 11,000 applications, totaling 154 million. Uh, right now, it's taking the state about four to five weeks from the time they receive an application until the time a household is paid or they receive their, their assistance. So, so far the state has paid just over 3,365 households in San Jose. Next slide, please. The local program, uh, which I mentioned we are in the process of closing out, uh, that program is managed by the city, the County Office of Supportive Housing, Destination Home, Sacred Heart, and 46 grassroots partners. That program launched back in May, and it stopped accepting new applications back in September in order for us to shift to the state program. And this local program is focused on reaching extremely low-income households in areas heavily impacted by COVID. We're wrapping up payments and closing out these applications, which we anticipate will be complete in two to three weeks. But the local program has assisted just over 4,000 households. 82% uh, are households of color. Next slide, please. So one of our primary strategies is offering in-person help for households to complete rental assistance applications. This is a really important service because we know many extremely low-income households don't have access to technology or the internet, or they may have a non-traditional or very complicated lease arrangement, and so they just need that extra in-person assistance, or they may have um, need assistance with language help. So the city opened two eviction prevention help centers in order to provide that in-person in assistance and support. Our eviction prevention help centers have been operating since August, and they're located at City Hall and the Franklin McKinley School District offices in East San Jose. Since that time, the centers have served just over 1,000 households the majority of which are Spanish language households. 
And recently, we have started having housing department staff at the courts two days a week on the days that the courts are hearing unlawful detainer cases. We're really excited about that partnership with the courts because we think it is extremely helpful uh, in, in us providing assistance to some of the most vulnerable households and those who are uh, in immediate um, danger of potentially losing their housing. Also, the county has recently expanded uh, services at a vaccine clinic on Story Road, and they've now created a services hub that now offers in-person rental assistance, as well as isolation and quarantine support. So now there are three places in San Jose that people can get in-person assistance. One of our other strategies is uh, what we call pop-up events. We uh, provide rental assistance in person in very targeted locations. So we're targeting certain zip codes, we're targeting certain census tracts, uh, and our, this is really work that we do in partnership with the community. We love to partner with schools, community groups, churches, um, to offer this in-person rental assistance event. And then lastly, we partner with the county's community health and business engagement team to do targeted door-to-door -door knocking to provide households with information and assistance with rental assistance. Next slide, please. So the other, uh, the third prong of our approach is really around legal services, legal support, tenant rights and education. And so we're working with local nonprofits to provide additional legal support. Last month, the Law Foundation and Bay Legal started providing on-site legal support, referrals and consultations at our eviction prevention help centers. Uh, there's also a, a bill in the last legislative cycle, AB 1487, that would have established a homelessness prevention fund administered by the state bar to support a grant-based program to provide education and legal services to prevent evictions uh, and avoid housing displacement. The, v the bill was vetoed. However, uh, in vetoing the bill, the governor indicated general support for eviction prevention services but he wanted to debate the policy change along with a budgetary appropriation, uh, which could happen in this next year's budget cycle. So that is something the housing department is um, monitoring and providing some advocacy for. And then finally, the housing department is exploring a legal clinic with a local uh, law school to provide some tenant rights, education, and legal assistance. Next slide, please. So I am just really appreciative uh, to share with the task force the work the housing department has been doing. We're so very proud of the work. Um, and there are great minds here this evening and people so deeply rooted in the community. But one of our asks of this group is for referrals and help with that targeted community outreach, providing us ideas for pop-up rental assistance events, connections to community groups, churches, schools that might benefit from help with rental assistance. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so very much, Reagan. Appreciate the presentation. Um, and yes, thank you for acknowledging so many members of our task force are have been tremendous and continue to be tremendous partners in this arena. So uh, with that, uh, we will open up to any questions or comments that the task force members may have. So um, I'll just ask you to raise your hand. And I think, Mike, you will call on folks and I think they can unmute themselves. I see Christine's hands up. Yeah, Christine Fitzgerald. Great, can you all hear me? 
Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay. Now, this is uh, really great and really needed. And um, along with many other uh, organizations, we too have been trying to provide um, <clears throat> rental assistance where we can through uh, various grants and et cetera. One, a couple of things that, that I'm curious about. One is any um, data being collected um, or could be collected on um, understanding what households may or may not have someone with a disability involved because this is an added component and an added um, complication, if you will, uh, to uh, you know prevent and mitigate um, eviction. Um, that's one of the first things. The other thing that, that um, I'd like to suggest possibly for future efforts is also coming up with um, adaptation or renovation uh, funding so that those that are continuing in uh, COVID fog, if you will, um, can also get um, possible needed adaptations to their current living situations to meet their current needs. Because as we know, um, there's some, some folks um, don't get over COVID completely. and may not ever completely get over COVID. So we do have to recognize that as well. For your question, Christine, um, let me take the, your first question, which was um, any data collected on households that have disabilities. Um, I, do, I don't think it's a formal data point that's collected, but I will say um, we I think we hear about it and learn about it uh, when we're working with a household, a lot of that in-person um, work with a, especially a, a very vulnerable household, we um, often understand that as, as we're listening to their story and helping them through the application process. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the application itself, um, I don't believe there's a question about disability. Might not be a bad second, thing to... I'm sorry? Uh, I, I was just going to say, it might not be a bad thing to add in. Yeah, we can certainly talk to the state about that. Um, and we're, we're actually developing a survey uh, for when we help a household so that is certainly a good question that we can add on our our mm -hmm. local survey and then your second question i think was around continued funding because um people will continue to be impacted uh, for some time to come if i'm understanding your your question right and um, we couldn't agree more uh, we we know the state recently submitted a request to the U.S. Treasury for an additional 1.9 billion for rental assistance for California households. Um, locally, are we have a local homelessness prevention and rental assistance program, and we are looking at um, continuing to scale up that program as funding is available. We do have. Uh, some state funding that will be available for us to scale a local program as well. All oh, right. Uh, I'd just like to add that, you know, um, given that COVID could affect somebody in a wide variety of ways, not the least to which, for example, the possible need to add, say, a ramp or grab rails or something of that nature within their unit, um, within their, um, uh, you know, their their space. Um, God forbid if they needed to move because their current space is 
uh, totally inaccessible. Um, that's a much bigger and much more complicated process, of course. But whatever we can do to mitigate um, having to move to a new place simply because there isn't enough adaptations at the moment, um, that really should, I think, be looked at. Thanks for that, Christine. All right, next uh, we have... I think I see... I'm sorry, Megan. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Mike. Next trying we have... to take over your job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Sally Gonzalez. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Reagan. Um, uh, right now, we are constantly, on a weekly basis, are reporting on disabilities um, through the state program. So that is that we do have to report on the state. So that is one of the questions that, that is being asked. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thanks. Um, the only thing that I wanted to say is one thing that we're, we're also working on is um, actually doing outreach to uh, families when they do pickups for after school programs. Um, so being at the after school programs, um, we're actually doing education and um, giving information about rental assistance. Um, and we're finding out because a lot of those families are working and once we give them that information, then we're able to set up appointments for those families. That was all. I think that's the last uh, hand. Uh, Rosalind, back to you. Great, thank you so much. So if no other questions, um, appreciate the feedback. Reagan, thank you so much for presenting the information. Um, and again, this information is so important that we connect right, these services and resources to our residents. So we thank the task force members in advance for helping us do that. Thank you, Reagan. So we're going to switch over now to small business recovery. A lot of great work is going on um, in this area. I'm going to turn it over to Nancy Klein, Director of the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, and she has a team with her tonight who's going to be presenting. Thank you, Nancy. Rosalind, thank you very, very much and good evening members of the task force. It really is a pleasure to get to be with you this evening. I did wanna mention as Rosalind did, my name is Nancy Klein and I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs name. Just this year, we elevated the words cultural affairs to be explicitly stated in the department's name because we know arts and culture is at the core of who we are and what San Jose aspires to be. This year, even more we've learned that arts and culture is essential to our healing as well as to our growth. With the advent of the pandemic, OEDCA pivoted almost exclusively all our activities to be focused on recovery, particularly for small business and individual workers, as well as to support affordable housing and emergency services. What you see on the slide here are the units that comprise Office of Economic Development, Cultural Affairs, Business Development, Arts and Culture, Work to Future, which is all about jobs, training, and skill development, is what you'll hear about in the next few slides. And you'll hear from the leaders in our OEDCA talking about their respective sections of recovery efforts. And lastly, what you won't hear about tonight, but is very much part of our office's work, real estate has engaged deeply in identifying and helping to implement sites for emergency housing, affordable housing, as well as for Measure T sites for police and fire. OEDCA looks forward to supporting the task force, Roseland and her team, as we do this important recovery work together. And now you'll hear from Blage Zalalich. 
Thank you, Nancy. Uh, next slide, if you will, Aurelia. So good evening, everybody. I'm Blagi Zalalich. I'm the Interim uh, Deputy Director for Business Development. Happy to be here with you this evening and want to just thank you all for giving of your time and your talent uh, to this effort. So thank you very much. As Nancy mentioned, uh, we primarily shifted our focus almost solely uh, to small business recovery and resiliency through the pandemic. Our uh, mighty team of six um, is making, continues to make, has been making the attempt to assist our 60,000 plus small businesses in the city. And so we really uh, decided that we needed to focus on what we were hearing most from the folks uh, that had the greatest need uh, in, in our uh, economic ecosystem. And those three areas of focus really have been and will continue to be access to capital, business outreach and connection. And then uh, thankfully we were also able to secure some federal funding that is gonna go towards providing additional technical support and resources to support the small business resiliency and recovery efforts in our city. Um, with respect to access to capital, we had numerous webinars, e-blasts, what we learned was that people really needed to know how to gain access to, um, to financial resources and quickly. With business outreach, there was nothing better um, than being able to walk into a business um, and look in the whites of somebody's eyes and really understand um, the resources that they needed to be connected to. So we did this both with targeted in-person and um, through a variety of different communication mechanisms. And what we learned, as I think you probably all do know already, is that strong neighborhood business associations, strong technical assistance providers, and other community networks really create uh, this wonderful network and act as a multiplier force uh, in the efforts of resiliency and recovery for our small business community. Next slide, Aurelia. And so to that end, um, over the next two years, we are going to be uh, focusing, our intention is to focus our American Rescue Plan funding in five specific areas. First of all, assisting the most vulnerable. Um, and through those efforts, uh, we're really happy to say that we're bringing on some additional bilingual staff. We realize the importance of communicating with people in the language that they're most familiar and most comfortable communicating in. Um, and then also the importance of ensuring that we had a, a citywide small business displacement policy. We, we realized that it was very important to build the small business ecosystem. And so what we're going to be doing over the next two years is implementing what we call the Boost Biz SJ program that has a variety of different facets to it, uh, which include broadening outreach both, both digital and otherwise to our small business community, um, opening up a Quetzal Garden Small Business Center with the help of our community partners, the Latino Business Foundation and Somos Mayfair, uh, a virtual business incubator startup center, and also strengthening, strengthening technical assistance resources focused primarily on businesses affected in the downtown, central, and East San Jose, which are the neighborhoods most affected through the pandemic. Next slide, please, Aurelia. Um, and so the three other factors that we're going to be focusing on is direct financial assistance uh, to those that haven't already uh, received either state or federal uh, government funding, strengthening our commercial corridors through a variety of the outreach uh, methods and mechanisms uh, that I spoke about, and then also really monitoring and paying attention to our city's economic health through a variety of new tools. Next slide, please. And so uh, what we are doing is making sure that the initiatives that are being pursued are increasing the resiliency of the San Jose small business community so that we can better weather the next crisis. We're, we are being very cognizant of measuring the impact of our work in a variety of different ways. And we're really hoping that uh, what the task force is going to be willing to do for us is to act as a sounding board for the implementation of these programs and also to serve as community ambassadors for this really important um, and hopefully sustainable work. 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague on the cultural affairs side of the business uh, support and resiliency effort, uh, Carrie Adams Hapner. Thank you, Blog A. Good evening, everybody. And I just wanna thank you for uh, giving us your time as part of this task force. And let me tell you a little bit about the Office of Cultural Affairs. Its mission is to be the champion of San Jose's artistic and cultural vibrancy resources and vision. And we do this through a number of different programs and services, but tonight I'm gonna to be focusing mostly on our ARP related, our American Relief Program funding and those services that we're providing as part of our recovery work. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so let me just first start by just sharing, you know, what is the impact of COVID-19 on our arts and culture sector? So before the pandemic, um, the economic impact of our arts sector in San Jose was $191 million on an annual basis, and it supported 4,255 jobs. And that's just a nonprofit part of the art sector. So when we had, as we all know, the arts were uh, among the first within the community to close due to the uh, COVID-19, and we're one of the last to come back online because of the restrictions around uh, gatherings. And so uh, the art sector experienced closures, loss of jobs, loss of cultural programming, and economic injury to artists, cultural workers, art organizations, art businesses, and businesses like hotels and restaurants due to the loss of audience spending. And so also we had a loss of our transient occupancy tax revenues uh, because of restrictions on travel. And that is the primary source of arts funding in our city. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, the city council was able to uh, appropriate $2.2 million in ARP funds to help supplement the loss of TOT funds. And with this funding, we provided grants to art nonprofits and creative entrepreneurs. And the grants are for general operating support programs, projects, and special events. And these grants are, um, the grant applications are adjudicated by a peer review panel. And the Arts Commission also provides counsel to the city. And so 109 grants were awarded by the Office of Cultural Affairs. And approximately 40 of these grants are for culturally specific organizations with others serving a very diverse audiences. And approximately 60% of our creative entrepreneur grants are awarded to BIPOC artists. And these grants made a very significant difference in the organization's financial sustainability through the pandemic. Um, and one of the ways in which I would love to hear from the task force is that how um, one of the things you brought up at the last meeting were ideas that related to cross sector collaboration involving the art. So I'd love to hear a little bit more elaboration about that. Next slide, please. And then I also just would want to point out some of the other work we're doing as part of our recovery assistance. Uh, we, we do what's called technical assistance workshops for our arts sector uh, with different themes where things like how to pivot during the pandemic or racial equity capacity building. And we work in partnership with organizations like SB Creates, the Center for Cultural Innovation and the Multicultural Art Leadership Institute. We also provide information and promote other grant funding opportunities like state and federal funded grants. For example, there's a shuttered venues grant program. And then we also connected arts organizations to reopening opportunities as part of the city's reopening during the summer. So there are a lot of great activations that included our arts uh, partners as part of the Abierto program. So with that, I am going to, um, turn it over to my colleague, Monique Melkor with Work the Future. Thank you, Carrie. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you again for being here. I'm Monique Melchor, Division Manager with Work the Future, and with me is my colleague, Elaine Malari, our Supervising Accountant. Work the Future assists individuals with upskilling to find employment pathways that lead to a successful career. We are currently focusing our work on low-resource census tracts to reach marginalized individuals. Next slide, please. 
Aurelia, the next slide, please. Thank you. Now, even with our economy having a 3.9 unemployment rate, the reality is that there is a significant portion of our population that continues to struggle. There is a persistence of economic disparity. In Santa Clara County, 52% of Latino households, 47% of African-American households, and 21% of AAPI households struggle with cost of living versus the 15% of white households. Also in Santa Clara County, the African-American unemployment rate is 63% higher, the Latino unemployment rate is 30% higher, and the AAPI unemployment rate is 16% higher than the white unemployment rate. The unemployment rate for adults with a high school diploma is 125% higher than adults with a bachelor's degree. This is more than double um, of those with a bachelor's degree. Next slide, please, Aurelia. In order to address this, Work to Future will continue to focus on high growth, high wage occupations for marginalized individuals in our area. We really look at current uh, industries that are favorable. The ones that we work on are construction and trades. We have a partnership with a very successful pre-apprenticeship program that introduces individuals to the trades. For advanced manufacturing, we recently partnered with a manufacturing company and a community college to provide an earn and learn experience. Uh, this gave an opportunity for individuals to earn an income while they were in a learning experience to help them forward in a job opportunity. For information technology, we recently partnered with Facebook on a project called Career Connections. This program provided digital training and a paid work experience internship opportunity for young adults. For healthcare, we are currently in discussion with a major healthcare provider to train individuals in the healthcare field or employment would be available after training. And lastly, for our finance and business services, we offer project management training, computerized accounting and bookkeeping. QuickBooks certification is a very popular course that we offer to small businesses and individuals looking for opportunities in finance. Historically, Work to Future serves from 2,000 to 3,000 clients a year with over 80% of those being BIPOC. Next slide, please, Aurelia. Next are some of the actions we are working on. Work to Future is currently in the process of relocating the one-stop center to the east side of San Jose, 1608 Las Plumas Avenue. We will be targeting outreach specifically to lo the low resource census tracts. We have staff that will be interfacing directly with residents in that area to promote our services and of course our new location. For our Work to Future youth and adult programs, we are expanding our earn and learn programs. We will also have incumbent worker training where we will work with employers to upskill employees to grow within their companies. We are also working on an entrepreneurship pathway to assist undocumented low-wage workers, and we have an online self-paced service called Metrics that provides over 5,000 courses that are available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Lastly, we are working with Bridge to Recovery, a collaborative of over 60 public and nonprofit agencies that are working together to provide resources to the residents of Santa Clara County. I will now turn it over to Elaine Malari for the rest of our presentation. Thank you, Monique. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so um, I'm here again, I'm Elaine Malari to talk about the Resilience Core program. Um, Ariella, can you please uh, do the next slide? Oh, okay, thank you. So this project is one of the programs currently being implemented to address community and economic recovery, particularly in the employment and workforce aspect. So this project is in line with the goals and objectives of Work the Future, which was discussed by Monique earlier. So as referenced in the March and June Mayor's budget message, Resilience Core is a jobs program created to focus on employing adults residing in high poverty, high unemployment neighborhoods to address two of our most urgent crises, climate change and the pandemic. This project is a 7.65 million program primarily funded by the American Rescue Package which actually centers upon a variety of paid work experience opportunities featuring a living wage rate and a term ranging from 25 to 30 weeks, which upon completion can lead to employment opportunities. Right now, the living wage rate that we are actually um, offering the participants is uh, tw at $25.31 per hour. The program's employment pathways and opportunities are focused on environmental stewardship, learning education recovery, and small business marketing support. Various multilingual outreach methods, primarily in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese, were done to identify the program participants 
with a priority to San Jose residents living in low resource census tracts or those that are very low income. The outreach components included social media, outreach through city council offices, nonprofits, universities and community colleges, CBOs, as well as extensive in-person outreach at various neighborhoods, community centers, libraries, and parks located in the low resource census tracts. Next slide, please. Oh, so, so the project uh, actually started as early as July of 2021, and this slide, as you can see, shows the program results today. As can be seen, a total of 195 individuals have already been enrolled across all pathways, exceeding the goal of 172. Today, the Resilience Core program features a 93% retention rate for those that are that initiated and are still continuing their work experience. Also, out of all the enrolled individuals, 87% are residing in the low resource census tracts and 93% are, are, are identified as BIPOC. Most participants also have multiple bi barriers such as very low income status, unstably housed, underemployed or unemployed. And lastly, I'd like to say that, uh, although it's not on this slide, there is actually a potential funding opportunity which may allow us to implement a second phase to continue the program. So that concludes our presentation. Um, we're now open, open to discussion, comments, and questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Elaine, and um, Carrie, and Monique, and Blague, and Nancy for all of the great information. Um, we'll open it up for Q&A or any comments by, by the task force. Um, I, I will add, I, I know that one of the things that's probably very important um, to the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs is to really get the help of many of our task force members who had a particularly business associations, but other organizations um, in helping us, again, get information. Um, to small businesses and to workers and to others. And again, connecting them to resources or just to hear about additional needs that they have so we can make some efforts in filling some of those gaps. So um, I see Mimi's hand is up. Yeah, Mimi Hernandez. Hi, good, good evening, everyone. And, and I really wanted to thank the entire team and the presentation. I think there's a lot of uh, very forward thinking in, as far as um, becoming a multiplier force by working with a lot of the partners, the business associations that are already um, in the ground. So I really want to commend the team for that and for some of the efforts. I was aware of some of the programs, but it's really, um, really great to hear about the bridges to recovery and the stuff that work to future um, uh, are doing. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, as you know, I'm also part of the Alum Rock um, Santa Clara Street Business Association. I think my, my colleague Jose might be on the call as well. But we did have a quick question. Um, we wanted some clarity on the Quetzal Gardens project because we're right, it's, it's right in our backyard and we're not aware of it, nor have we been invited to that conversation. So we wanted to just kind of, if, if somebody could send this information or introduce us to the players, that would be great. Um, um, the implementation of the Boost San Jose uh, base, is there any way for you guys to give us more information about that? I think this is a, um, another good way of distributing information. One of the things that we identified is that a lot of our businesses don't have the digital competency to take classes, um, kind of follow along. So um, working with direct service providers that are local, that are here, that kind of understand the landscape, uh, would be really valuable. And there are a number of organizations that are part of the BOSS partnerships that have feet on the ground. So I would really encourage uh, those organizations to be engaged and making sure that even though it's great that we have these tools and I do a lot of my classes online, I did recognize that there are a lot of folks that are not comfortable with a computer and it does limit their growth. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we had um, cognizance of that. Um, and I think that's all I had. If, if, you can, if you can send us a little bit more information uh, about some of the components of these programs, 
Uh, they sound really interesting and I'd, I'd wanna make sure that maybe we have a presentation during the next boss meeting, just to learn a little bit more about what is happening. Uh, but I think there's a lot of forward thinking and I really wanna thank uh, Blagay and the team for everything they're doing and how they're constantly touching base with us to, uh, to advise us and to really listen and figure out how we can all recover from this. So thank you. Yeah, if I could just for one second, thank you, Mimi, for, for bringing up those both comments and questions. You're absolutely um, have been a great partner in all the work. I think you saw on the slide, I couldn't, couldn't read everything on the slide in my three and a half minutes that I was given, uh, but certainly the work around property-based improvement districts and the work that we're doing in Allen Rock and, and trying to um, boost the Allen Rock Business Association and its members is a key component of our recovery work. And so what we're doing is, you know, we're, we were trying to find a name for kind of all of the initiatives wrapped up in one. And so that's kind of what we're using as the boost biz. Ah. SJ, it's really, it's really all of those things that we were talking about. It's kind of, it's all of the programs, but as we get um, deeper into implementation of all of those programs, the revamping of the boss network, um, the launch of uh, Ketzel Gardens in, in, um, in partnership with the Latino Business Foundation um, and other folks, we are going to be engaging more and more um, our partners and boss. So this is just the first, Mimi, um, with, for you especially, but even our other partners uh, that you're hearing and you guys are and will continue to be an integral part of building our uh, sustainable and resilient small business community from, from the ground up and from the grassroots. All so right. you're definitely not getting off the hook, Mimi, just so you know. Well, I mean, I mean thank you. I mean, I mean you, uh, you know, you saw today we, we had uh, a business that kicked off in Alum Rock, you know, and, and kicked it into high gear. And that's a creation of 50 local jobs. You know, a lot of those employees live in the neighborhood out in Alum Rock. And that took a collaboration, you know, with the city and other nonprofits. So, I mean, that's really what we should be doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, next up is Christine Fitzgerald. You don't have to get used to hitting that button. Anyway, so um, to, to start, uh, I commend, you know, all the efforts that's going on that are going on to bring um, the different uh, small businesses back. Um, it's certainly a huge challenge. <laughs> In my one of my past lives, I worked for a, um, a YWCA uh, Mid Peninsula in Palo Alto. Sadly, it's not there anymore. But the Women Entrepreneurs Program really emphasized getting women business owners up and running. Uh, I'd like to strongly urge and suggest that folks look at, at folks with all kinds of different disabilities as both uh, entrepreneurs, employers, and consumers of these different things. And certainly after 31 years of having uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, nobody um, is running after anyone, you know, turning a lawsuit, we're more interested in making sure that um, people can access a business in order to partake of that business, just like anyone else. Uh, I'd also like to suggest that uh, folks look to connecting with um, places like uh, SCORE, Project Hired, uh, YWCA of uh, um, Santa Clara County, I, which I believe still has their entrepreneur program, uh, but really looking to connect with uh, other groups and other community members to um, increase the strata, if you will, and you know technical assistance, uh, working with folks with disabilities, certainly looking at Project Hire, looking at, at uh, um, SVILC, but also looking within the community itself because who better to know about disability than the person with a disability? And I, I like to recognize one other thing, and that is disability is um, 
something that can happen to anyone at any time, and it doesn't discriminate. It, it affects people of color, people of high income, low income, everywhere in the middle, doesn't matter. We're all in this together, nothing about us without us. Thank you very Thank you. much, Christine. Sarah McDermott. Hi, Sarah McDermott. I'm with Unite Here Local 19. We represent hospitality workers in San Jose. And um, one area that I think touches on a lot of the pieces here is uh, that I think would be great for this group to focus on is airport hospitality and hotel workers and their recovery. Um, it, you know, as, as we're starting to recover, travel has been one of the slower areas, especially business travel. So this is impacting workers at the airport, workers at the convention center, workers at hotels. And I think this is an area where the city touches a lot of those pieces, right? Um, the, obviously the, the airport and the convention center, the city has a large role to play. So, um, and these are also workers who have been extremely affected by the pandemic. Uh, it's estimated that 90% of hospitality workers were out of work at, during COVID. So I think this is an area where it would be great for this group to have a focus um, and um, I'm not sure when we're proposing solution groups, but I'd like to offer that as a proposed solution group. All right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, and we're gonna be getting to that toward the end of the agenda, so thanks. I just right, wanna next. say thanks to Sarah for bringing up that really important point. That was, thank you for that. All right, uh, next hand is Dolores Alvarado. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the great presentation. I, I have to be honest, I truly, truly enjoyed the, the two, all four pieces, but two that really speak to us as the representative of 10 community health centers, uh, 40 sites, two thirds of them are in San Jose, maybe even higher, is the um, possibility of looking at workforce issues uh, because we know we're all having them healthcare in particular, and we're, we're not necessarily talking about MDs, et cetera, nurses, but more of the other type of health workers that are support um, to the logistics of a, of a clinic. Um, and then the, the potential connection to the arts. Uh, we know that through the arts, you can find a lot of healing, which is, I find that interesting. And I think it's been addressed in, in some ways already in, in the um, presentations. But I just thought this is an opportunity to look at these two together, possibly, along with perhaps some of the work that work, uh, workforce work, what is it, work to the future, uh, Monique's presentation. And I'd love to follow up with you, Monique, on some ideas. Um, so thank you for doing that. And I know last time I brought up the issue of chronic disease. Uh, clearly, healthcare per se is under the auspices of the county. We, we understand that. But I think that there is a piece of recovery around living with chronic disease that could potentially be addressed through this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those good comments. Yeah, thank you so much. You can definitely get in touch. Um, we did have a conversation a while ago before the pandemic. So yeah. yes, and then the pandemic happened. So I remember you very well. I remember, yeah. I'll, I'll get in touch again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Monique. Of course. All right, that looks like the last hand. Rosalind, back to you. Awesome, great. Uh, so the next recovery initiative we're going to cover is food and necessities distribution. And I believe we have John Cicerelli on the call to kick us okay. off. John, oh, you'll be with your, yeah, I'd be okay. with my call. Yeah, yeah. John will be here with you tonight. Hi, All nice right. to you. Well, we're so glad to have you. Um, please go ahead, introduce yourself. Uh, Wien is the program manager of the Food and Necessities Branch. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the task force, and thank you for your time and your effort. I'm Wien Mai, the interim program manager for the Food and Necessities Branch. 
John Cesarelli, our um, Director of Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services, cannot be here tonight. Um, but I also want to be a special thanks to our Food and Assessors team for their dedication and hard work throughout this um, entire process. And especially a huge thank you to our former program manager, Jack Datlu, who was a huge contribution to our team as well. So I just do want to do that shout out. Um, tonight, I will be highlighting our, our partners contribution and our city's contribution and efforts in helping our community. Um, next slide, please. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so for the food and, uh, food and necessities distribution team, we have six programs that help facilitate over 9 million meals per month to residents most vulnerable and affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the services is meal and grocery um, delivery services for our seniors, the homeless, low income, and our vulnerable residents in the federally uh, defined qualified census traps. Um, these are our partners here. We, we partner with a lot of our nonprofit nonprofits here in the city of San Jose and in the, and in the county. Um, we have here San Jose Conservation Corps and Charter School, the Health Trust, Catholic Charities um, of Santa Clara County, Off the Grid, Team San Jose, uh, second Harvest of Silicon Valley, Loaves and Fishes, and Batement Community Living. So our partners have been a huge asset during this time. And it's our goal um, is to continue to provide food distribution and addressing the food insecurity in our community as there is still a, still a huge, tremendous amount of need. Um, next slide, please, Ariel. Um, and also, um, you know, picking back then over to the, our, new, our uh, food and necessity for our distribution or senior nutrition program. So our senior nutrition um, serves older adults who are over 60 plus. And during the pandemic, there was a huge demand in the services that we are already providing for our senior nutrition program, which is a partnership with Santa Clara County. So we, there was a demand for meals that had increased from 15,380 meals per month with an increase to 30,932 meals since the COVID pandemic. Um, and the food and necessities services was able to supplement in a, an average of 9,000 meals per month uh, with our curbside pickup model. And our curbside pickup model, it was lo um, located in our community center. So in, in this photo right here, you see uh, many of the seniors are being able to pick up the, their meals at the Mayfair Community Center. Uh, we are going to start we anticipate to move senior nutrition to in-person meals um, starting in January of 2022. Next slide, please, Ariel. Um, to highlight a few of our accomplishments and our contribution with, uh, throughout uh, in our partnerships with this, the county and our nonprofit organizations and um, our other or and other organization. The city has helped facilitate a distribution of over two million meals within the county since March of 2020. Um, we, there has been a reduction in ramp down of services and, and programs. We went from 20 um, programs in 2020 um, to six programs today. However, we're still currently providing 25, 25 million meals quarterly. Also for the, our, team, our food and necessities team, the um, American Rescue um, Plan uh, funding for, has been able to fund 4.8 million which is allocated for the food and necessity service in 21, uh, 2021 and 22. And then also 10.1 million of the American Rescue Plan um, is allocated for the Food Boxing Resilience Corps um, for this fiscal year. Um, another thing is we're balancing the short-term federal funding with the long-term federal funding. So to highlight that is the city has utilized as much federal funding as we can to help with recovery and to address the need. Um, and the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed that there is a food insecurity in our community and the city's long, our long-term goal is to help close this gap. And so we are, what we're trying to do is to partner and uh, with the county. So the county has established a working group to analyze the food insecurity problem and has also worked with the UNIS, uh, with the University of California Santa Cruz extension to collect data to determine the gaps in the food insecurity and hopefully that we can build a more sustainable food network in our county. Um, okay, and let's see. And that's the, that, that is um, it for our, um, our presentation. All right, thank you so much. We appreciate the information. Um, thank you. Open up again to questions, comments. Um, 
I am not seeing any hands. Mike, are you seeing any hands? Don't want I to am miss anyone. not. No, I think uh, I think they did a good job at their presentation. So <laughs> much answers, much, and I'll answer. All right, great. Okay, thank you so much, we and again, appreciate your time this evening. Thank you, Rosalyn. Okay. Uh, the next recovery initiative um, we're going to go over is digital equity. And uh, I do believe that we have Jill Bourne um, on the line. If not, um, then Ann Grabowski will be walking us through this presentation. We're both here, Rosalyn, but Ah, I see that you're uh, both Christine, here. That's awesome. I say Christine actually has her hand up perhaps from the last item Oh, or okay. Thank I just you. want to pause. Yeah, thank you for now. I we just missed those those hands. I must have just gone up. So I see both uh Claudia, I see your hand up. I think Christine was first. Oh, I'm sorry, Christine. Yeah, I was muted, unmuted. Here we go. Okay, so um, the fantastic program all around to have the Judith security um, addressed. Um, as this pandemic continues, Uh, and hopefully ramps down soon, please God. Um, one thing we need to, to, to remember is that uh, some folks are going to have even more difficulty in uh, getting their food um, delivered, either because they have a disability such that they can't get out due to uh, their medical restrictions, or just the physical process, but it does take a lot of effort for a lot of people to do that. So <clears throat> having these uh, critical uh, advances is great, great to see it that it's for uh, those that are 65 and older. I would, I would like to suggest that it continues uh, for folks under 65 as well. And I'd also like to suggest that, that <clears throat> thought is given to perhaps um, uh, continuing this even after the pandemic for those that, um, I hate the term um, um, homebound, but that's basically uh, what it turned out to be, so. Great, thank you so much, Christine. And I, I bring up very good points. And, um, you know, we had mentioned that we'll be working with the county. I mean, one of the things that the pandemic, right, did highlight that so many of our residents do have um, issues with food insecurity. And so obviously we want to take some steps to, to fill that gap. So thank you for your comments. It looks like uh, Claudia Damiani had her hand up. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just want to ask a question. Before the pandemic, we already had around 24% of families struggling with food insecurity in the county. And as it was mentioned, um, this change the, or this program is not only focused on increasing access to food, but also a strength the food system. So I wanted to ask if there is a focus uh, related to local purchases and supporting our local farmers in South County. Thank you. Hi, hi. I'll have CJ Ryan on the phone who will, um, on the presentation, will answer your question. Hi, good evening. CJ Ryan with Parks Recreation Neighborhood Services. So that is a great question, Claudia. One of the things that we did when the pandemic hit is that we launched our program very quickly uh, with local folks that could make, uh, make it happen, right? One of our strongest, one of our largest partners is the food bank, um, Second Harvest Food Bank that um, distributes meals to the community. We were also partnering uh, with folks like who, many of whom are on the call with Catholic Charities, with Off the Grid and Veggie Lucian um, and a number, a number of different programs. I think, you know, Bateman is also part of it. So that is something that we're interested in. I do 
want to take your comments back with us. Uh, we'll be meeting with the county next week um, to have that broader discussion around the long-term food system and addressing food insecurity in the county. So I'll certainly take your comments back and incorporate that into the thinking. All right. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, Derek Rapsi. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, piggybacking on the comment before about people having access to the food or having uh, the, the possible inability to get to the food, how involved is Meals on Wheels uh, getting food to people at, or also mobile vans where they can go around to, to the different areas and different communities for people who have a difficulty, either uh, you know, seniors or people with disabilities uh, so that they can have that access to food? Meals on Wheels is one of the programs that we have funded since uh, the summer of 2020 and will continue to fund through uh, the end of this fiscal year. So they're an important partner. Uh, we work with the Health Trust and their Meals on Wheels program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're ready to begin with the next presentation with Jill and Ann. Hi, we're back. Great. Oh, good you, evening, Jill. everyone. Um, I am Jill Bourne. As uh, Rosalind said, I'm city librarian and director of the San Jose Public Library. And I'm joined with Ann Grabowski, who is the library's division manager for digital equity initiatives. So next slide, please. We all know that one of the greatest impacts of the pandemic on our communities was that it exacerbated the existing digital divide and deep inequities in digital access, connectivity, and agency. We knew from earlier engagement with our residents that there were a number of barriers, all of which were compounded by the shelter at home, especially for students and their families when all schools closed. So Ann and I had started leading the digital inclusion team in the Emergency Operations Center back in April of 2020. It included hardworking staff from departments across the city, including information technology, public works, libraries, of course, uh, the city's manager's office, and uh, the Department of Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services. And our immediate focus was on alleviating the digital gap for students and distance learning, connecting unconnected or underconnected households, expanding opportunities for Wi-Fi access around city facilities. So we were very intentional about leveraging all the assets and partnerships that we could to advance this work, which we're gonna review in the next few slides. So next slide for Anne. Thanks, Jill. As we started to understand what work laid ahead of us to alleviate the digital divide issues um, that predated the pandemic, but were so deeply felt at the beginning of the pandemic, our team came together to understand exactly where having a place-based approach might make the most sense and centering equity throughout the work. So using census data that was available, we created a, what, what now is called the Digital Equity Priority Index, which calculates scores of different census blocks uh, or census tracts, I'm sorry, um, over a myriad of different indicator areas that might indicate how many people in a census tract would need digital connectivity services. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we selected K through 12 enrollment because of the um, pandemic's impact on the shift to digital learning, poverty rate for that um, census tract, households with no computer and households with no internet access, then the population in the households with limited English proficiency, um, and we overlaid that with opportunities, kind of go fast opportunities, existing partnerships that we could leverage to move faster um, with our solution. So the map you see before you is, um, is San Jose split amongst its census tracts and ranked from highest priority census tract to lowest priority census tract. We can move forward. Here are our 2020, 2021 accomplishments. So I think most people on this call have heard at length about um, the massive number of hotspots that have been distributed to San Jose residents. We distributed 12,800 hotspots directly to students across 32 local education agencies. 
local education agency is just a fancy word for school um, without saying districts or charters. Uh, so we worked across the spectrum of education partners and distributed thousands and thousands of hotspots to students directly. Um, we've circulated 3000 hotspots through the San Jose Public Library. Those were 100% checked out from the months of March through June. And um, we've recently added additional hotspots. Those are nearly 100% checked out as well. We continue to build and manage community Wi-Fi uh, networks throughout Eastside Union High School District attendance areas. We had three operational in the last fiscal year. We have three in design and two in the planning stages. We built outdoor um, Wi-Fi networks in parking lots and parks. Um, the parking lots were at libraries, select libraries and community centers throughout San Jose and um, in parks there are in general open spaces in parks there are 24 buildings that um, buildings and and parking lots that had wi-fi added to them throughout san jose we participated in as a grantee and also provided leadership to the san jose digital inclusion fund we hosted significant numbers of community conversations in multiple languages to seek community feedback and input on what the solutions should be how they were working and what other things we should consider we hosted eight different cohorts of our digital literacy program um, we, we completed eight of those uh, and we were running 12 of them as the fiscal year shifted and we continued planning with our education partners for the this current academic year we can move to the next slide please this year we're focused on those same things um, kind of simplified and narrowed into four program areas. We're continuing to support hotspot distribution. Um, we're mostly shifting the, the distribution of hotspots through the San Jose Public Library. It's simpler for schools to be able to refer their families to the public library rather than spend so much staff time managing hotspot distribution on their own. So we're continuing to work in partnership to make sure that our students are connected we're continuing to manage the development and construction of community Wi-Fi areas uh, throughout San Jose. We're working to expand awareness and access to the emergency broadband benefit program um, and other affordability programs available through federal subsidy and are providing additional leadership to the Digital Inclusion Fund as we develop um, the round three grant proposals. All of this is in a changing environment for federal and state funding, and we're continuing to adapt and understand resources that are available through um, the various levels of government. We'll go back to Jill. Thank you. Of course, the city uh, could not design and implement all of this without so many deep partnerships. This slide shows actually only about a half of the partners with whom we actually have formal agreements and programs that are intended to reach our residents and to both understand and meet their digital resource needs, which as you can see, span from infrastructural to technical, to tangible equipment, to personal capacities in the area of digital literacy. Next slide. And then in addition to collaborations, the programs that Anne reviewed uh, have been made possible through city council allocated resources. In the last fiscal year, these efforts were funded with approximately $10.8 million from two sources, the city's funding that originated from the coronavirus relief funds and a community development block grants. And then in the current fiscal year, we're utilizing approximately $8 million with a combination of that city funding, additional American Rescue Plan funds and CDBG funds. We are happy to answer any questions and also we're very eager to get the task force engagement in some uh, sort of new and current opportunities for guidance and feedback. We're really interested in additional thought leadership on reaching residents in need and creating referral systems. The programs that we've implemented have reached thousands of residents and yet we're always aware that there are, you know, the hardest to reach households are sometimes the most in need and would love uh, more uh, work and collaboration on that. The quality evaluation of our existing Wi-Fi network areas and programming, the public Wi-Fi network is, is a new thing for the city and um, 
as we are implementing it, we're also very interested in evaluating and improving and ensuring that it works for our residents. And then future thinking about programming and infrastructure offerings in the area of digital equity. So with that, thank you so much for your time. Great, right. thank you so much, Jill um, and and um, really great work and so important, right, to get our community connected um, during the pandemic and, and really uh, throughout. We want more and more connected digitally. Um, so Mike, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to call on, on raised hands. All right, it looks like we have Mimi Hernandez. Yeah, I hope I'm, I'm not coming across as a big mouth, but I'm super excited about this part. Um, this is one of the areas where we really dive in. Um, Jill and Anne, thank you so much. The only thing I would add, I think there's a lot of good initiatives coming. And um, I guess if you wanna look for the silver lining in everything that happened, is that for a lot of Latinx and immigrant uh, communities, they, were the, they, they started to kind of learn a little bit more about distant uh, learning, which had been like such an abstract concept to them. Uh, what I wanted to add uh, for me, I'm coming from the lens of the self-employed, micro enterprises, um, women between the ages of 35 to 65 that kind of escaped, you know, even, even though they might've gone to school here, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't taught at the time and they don't have the access to that. So for example, if my team teaches a marketing class about how to get online and we, we do a bootcamp, there's still a lot of fear for these folks because they usually wait for one of their kids or one of their employees to come in and help them. So I would, the only thing I would ask as you guys are looking to innovate in new ways, um, is there a way to adapt some of these offerings uh, to be able to extend it to that community of the micro enterprises, uh, the self-employed folks, um, women who are, I'm not gonna say old cause I'm about that age group, you know, women between that 37 to 65 cap that, that really need more hands-on computer training. Um, so that's, I mean, that's that's pretty much my only feedback. And then, you know, of course, I, I'm happy to meet with you guys and offer you guys some of the, um, the resources that we in that, uh, do in that arena as well. But when we are looking at what programs are out there, they're all very geared for school children and for families at home. But we haven't found a lot that are specific um, for the small entrepreneur that doesn't know how to check email, um, doesn't have the practice so that if we're able to teach them marketing so that they can do some of the implementation themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. And actually, uh, that some of the adult classes that we've done, I think, could be adapted really well with partnership. And so we would definitely love to talk to you about that. Um, we do offer them in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And um, we're, in the next year, going to be expanding that type of support in a workforce with a workforce lens, especially to women um, who are interested in opening childcare. So uh, we would love to talk with you more. Thank you, Joe. Uh, all right, uh, thank you. And just we, to uh, remind the people on the call, we will have an opportunity for public comment at the end. So if you're a member of the public, uh, just hold on and you'll be allowed two minutes to speak at the end. All right, our next uh, person is Derek Grassi. Grassi, yes, thank sorry. you very much. Uh, enjoy the presentation. Um, I live on the east side of, of, of San Jose, and uh, I know for years the former superintendent of the East Side Union High School District, Chris Funk, was trying to get internet access for, for, for some of the schools. Um, we live in Silicon Valley. We sh should be the leaders in all technology for our communities, and uh, it's, it's almost incredible to believe that we, we have Wi-Fi access issues. Uh, I'm glad things are moving in the right direction. I'm glad to see there's pro pro progress, but I think we really need to make this a priority for, for businesses, for education, and to really make a difference for, for our community. But, but thank you again for, for, for the information. I appreciate it. Thank you. 
And uh, next we have, forgive me if I mispronounce this, uh, Muktiar. Muktiar, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I echo actually just the comments that uh, Derek made. We are in the Silicon Valley. And uh, oh, by the way, my name is Muktiar from Evergreen Islamic Center. Uh, I had a, a specific question on the, the hotspot rollout that we, we heard about 12,000 plus hotspots. So two questions related to that. One, um, it's good to have the internet access. I'm glad that we are expanding that um, and having that uh, easily accessible Wi-Fi uh, hotspots. Uh, but I'm assuming that hotspot is only you know, one part of the picture because I can connect to the Wi-Fi hotspot but what really matters is how much is the bandwidth available on the back end if uh, you have a huge concentration of users connecting to the same hotspot the experience may not be as good and even connectivity may not be there so we'd like to understand some more details it may not be perhaps on this call we'd like to see um, who we can get in touch with to get some more details and also uh, this being then the public access, uh, you know, providing uh, public access, I'm assuming there's some uh, security posture also implemented as part of this access. So I'd like to understand that as well. Thank you. Yes, and we'd be happy to have a, a fuller conversation. Uh, I would tell you that there were uh, there was a lot of uh, conversation around ensuring that the hotspots that we settled with or that we ended up distributing were um, of a quality and were unthrottled in terms of bandwidth so that they could support multiple streaming devices in one household. And our staff even tested them <laughs> in our own households and, and were able to push back uh, with our partners at at and to get the highest quality hotspot possible. So that was part of the process definitely as, as uh, and I, I actually think that having a library um, you know, in those conversations was really helpful because we are all about access and we're not afraid to push back. Um, and then uh, the more technical questions we could, I know Anne knows so much, we could answer that or we could have a separate conversation. It's up to you. Yeah, we can have one. separate, I think. Okay. So, yeah, I Appre appreciate the response. Thank, Thank you. you. Perhaps all just right. for clarity um, for the whole group that may not have been tracking the whole conversation, um, the hotspots that we distributed, just to be very direct, um, the hotspots that we distributed and are managing through the San Jose Public Library are high speed, unthrottled, um, unlimited, um, unlimited data hotspots that can support up to 15 connected devices in the home. So it's, it's literally the highest quality commercial grade um, device you can buy on the market. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, next up, Hugo Garcia. Thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to, I guess, second now uh, Mukhtar's comment. Uh, I think that was something that was on my mind as well, is just the quality of the connection um, for the students. Um, so thank you for, for addressing that already. I think just also just the complexity of this issue it involves uh, devices, it involves connectivity, it co involves access, accessibility, and, and I think um, putting it in the library system is a good strategy. I, I think that's a good, a good way that, that um, families are already aware of, of the library as a, as a place to go and, and receive other, uh, you know, either whether it be books or, or other um, things that they, they need. And so I think that's a good, a good place to store these as well and, and to distribute them from in the future. Um, but I, I do still think that there's um, a need to have them at the school site, whether that maybe be a mobile um, way to get them there or a mobile outreach of some sort. Um, and uh, just that direct contact, I think is still something that's important for, for families to, to know that this is something that's available. Um, and so I, that's, that's my only comment uh, that I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you for that. I just wanted to comment that, we, you know, we had, a, we did have about 60 
external partners for the distribution of hotspots so to again to try to get more out to folks uh, where they are. And um, so any organizations that would like to partner uh, who haven't before yet, uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to do that. All right, thank you. Uh, Christine, please, Jill. I'm going to start with um, full disclosure. I do sit on the uh, on Digital Inclusion Advisory Task Force, uh, but I'm not coming uh, uh, to this question from that perspective. I am coming to it from um, SVILC. Um, I'm wondering what, what has been done or what will be done to uh reach out to the um special education uh santa clara county office of special education uh to possibly better address uh issues of um not necessarily connectivity but um the recognition and understanding that some folks with uh particular disabilities don't do it all well uh with um working from a computer uh, some folks work far better to it and resting uh in person in person learning is far better for many folks and i'm just wondering what um what insights what um feedback you're possibly getting from the uh office of special ed over at um uh santa Clara county office of ed Thanks so much, Christine. The County Office of Education has been probably our strongest partner as we've worked through the program development and the deployment of resources um, throughout this effort. I think one thing that is helpful to note is that not only were students who were um, who have special education needs, they they actually were they disproportionately they how do I say this? They received hotspots at a disproportionately high uh, rate um, to make sure that those who could be connected at home were connected at home. So when we look at the comparison groups, we see that there were many more students that received our hotspots um, who, who needed a special education support um, than existed in the general population. And so we were, we were pleased to see that because it reinforced what, we, what our partnership was um, Kind of hinged on. We also know that all schools in Santa Clara County were bringing those students who needed um, in-person learning back into very small uh, in-person co classroom cohorts throughout the stay-at-home order when schools were typically closed. And so we know that both of those things were happening. We've worked really closely with the County Office of Education to track um, kind of program development, and we're, we're seeing the results in our reporting of, of those student outcomes as we kind of look back at the last school year. We'll continue to track that because it's critical um, and important. And as we learn more, you know, we'll, we'll get even better at it. So thank you very much for, for continuing to assert that. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, that looks like our last hand, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you both Jill and Ann for being with us this evening and presenting. Appreciate all your good work. All right, so our last recovery initiative uh, that we're going to hear from this evening is on childcare. Um, and uh, we have with us from the Department of Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services, Hal Spangenberg, who is going to lead off the presentation and introduce his team. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, good evening, task force members and members of the public. Uh, my name is Hal Spangenberg, and I am the division manager uh, for the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services. And I've also served as the assistant director of the EOC child care branch for the city of San Jose for the past 20 months. The child care branch of the EOC was established in response to the COVID-19 pandemic emergency in March of 2020. 
with the realization that the city of San Jose would serve a pivotal role in childcare throughout the pandemic and has included numerous staff from PRNS and the library, including Nick Georgioff and Lauren Hancock, who will present with me this evening. The Department of Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services and San Jose Public Library began collaborating on childcare programs and options for vulnerable families in March of 2020. The branch administered programming for over 400 school-age students, providing academic support, enrichment, and physical activities in a safe and supervised environment during the 2020-21 academic school year. In conjunction with school year programming, the branch coordinated child care programs in the summer of 2020 and the summer of 2021 to provide full day child care to approximately 900 youth weekly during the summer months. During the first quarter of 2021, the child care branch identified and executed on two objectives and key results, also referred to as OKRs, which were to launch 31 child care programs for 1,000 students grades K through 8 at two city youth centers, one community center, and 28 schools across San Jose, and also to launch 18 San Jose Recreation Preschool classes for 210 children ages 3 to 5 across 12 community centers and parks. During the second quarter of 2021, the branch identified and executed on two additional OKRs, which were to increase the enrollment in after school and preschool programs by 300 youth and to complete site evaluations and quality standard assessments for 31 after school programs and 16 preschool programs. Nick and Lauren will be providing details on PRNS and library programs on the next slides. Next slides, please. All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Nick. I, uh, so for Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services, we are currently serving 1700 youth every single day between the ages of three and 18 years of age. Um, of those youth, about 175 are preschool aged and 1500 of those um, are between kinder and 12th grade. Uh, we all currently operate 56 programs, that's 16 unique preschool classes and 40 unique programs that serve K to 12. Uh, I'm gonna turn it now over to Lauren Hancock with San Jose Public. Thanks, Nick. Good evening, everyone. Lauren Hancock, Lauren Hancock here, Community Programs Administrator with the Library. I'll be sharing updates on two of our library programs, beginning with the virtual homework clubs. In academic year 2021, library developed and launched a virtual homework club to assist children and families during the height of the pandemic. The learning objectives for staff and students and coaches were developed in alignment with the city's expanded learning quality standards. Over the course of the fall 2020 and spring 2021 semesters, 209 volunteer coaches assisted 207 unique students. Caregivers surveyed reported that programs allowed students to have more opportunity to complete their homework due to having a stronger understanding of their underlying concepts. Caregivers also noted that children trusted staff and coaches and saw them as role models and felt comfortable asking them questions. Next slide, please. So transitioning to our SJ Learns grant program, in the fiscal year 21-22, our SJ Learns will support and provide funding for expanded learning programs at eight local education agencies across 27 school campuses. Our program is projected to serve 1,355 students. All grantees or program providers use the city adopted expanded learning quality standards. SJ Learns grantees will also participate in a community of practice that are aligned to the quality standards. They use that space for sharing best practices and building relationships. Next slide. Uh, through the utilization of internal department scholarship funding, community development block, block grants, coronavirus relief fund, and American Rescue Plan funds, which includes 800K this fiscal year, the child care branch has been able to provide these programs at no cost to eligible families, distributing nearly $5 million in scholarships throughout the city of San Jose, thereby providing much needed support to those in desperate need of affordable child care. These programs have been administered by over 300 staff, including frontline staff and key management positions within the library and PRNS. Over 100,000 meals have been distributed through child care programs to fight food insecurity as well. And as Nick mentioned in previous slides, we are currently operating 56 programs connected to child care. 
Looking forward, the child care branch will be working directly with the new assistant to city manager position tasked to develop a youth master plan. The selection is expected to be announced shortly, and we would welcome your support, guidance, expertise, and feedback in the development of that youth master plan. In addition, we are confident that additional scholarship funds will be allocated towards child care and are always looking for assistance in outreach and ensuring that our programs are accessible to those in the community most in need. And with that, we're open for questions and discussions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Hal, appreciate that. Um, Mike, are there any raised hands? Oh, again, another fine presentation. Oh, uh, we have Christine got her hand up here. Oh, go ahead, Christine. Uh, so um, for folks that might be interested, there's a program called Yo Disabled and Brown. So what it means is youth organizing disabled and proud. And so we have a chapter of it in at SVILC. My suggestion to anyone that is interested in learning more about it, contact Joe Escalante. He is the assistive technology uh, coordinator at SVILC. And the phone number for SVILC can be uh, given out at this time or later time or offline, just and it's whatever people want. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. All right, that looks like that's it for the hands. Okay, great. All right, well, again, I just wanna thank again, all of the city staff um, who, up. Oh, I, I see a hand before I go on. Araceli? Araceli Sierra. Sí, soy yo. Hay dos Aracelis, ¿verdad? Okay, do we have the interpreter oh. ready? Oh, sí, gracias. Solo quería estar segura. Oh, pues me encanta todo lo que se ha hecho y también pues lo que se está haciendo. Y también me gusta escuchar que están implementando deportes y actividades. No más me gustaría escuchar como un poquito más porque escuché muchas actividades y mucho apoyo académico, solo cual es genial, pero me escuch me gustaría escuchar un poquito más a uh, si en todo ese apoyo también están incluyendo lo que es um, puedo decir salud mental como quizá a uh, los Uh, ¿Cómo, es, cómo está, se están apoyando para ayudar a los estudiantes a pasar por todo esto, todo este año de pandemia y todos los, sus sentimientos encontrados que lamentablemente muchas muchos familiares han fallecido de algunos niños o cómo, cómo se está incluyendo esa parte en este aspecto y cómo también... Uh, me encantan lo de los deportes, pero cómo puede ser accesible uh, y gratis para, para todos los niños, pero también para esas personas que lo necesitan. So, quizá usando los un, recursos que podemos usar, se me viene a la mente lo que ya tenemos, los parques uh, de los que estaban comentando, a los centros comunitarios, las organizaciones sin fines de lucro que po podrían ser lugares accesibles y quizá cómo poner algunos fondos para que sea una ayuda constante, tanto para los niños, pero también para todas las personas que necesitan ese tipo de apoyo. Espero que se me di a entender. <laughs> Gracias. Yes, just as a reminder to all participants, if to hear the translation, you must be in the English channel, please. And the translator, you can translate that now, please.
Katerina, I think you need to let him or let the interpreter out of the Spanish line. Yeah, um, for all participants, you have to switch to the English channel. Check English for your, in order to hear the translation. We we are, I'm sure most of us are in the English. Can it, Can everyone hear him or no? We don't hear anything. I can hear you. The interpreter has to move over. Have him, have the interpreter move over to us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Armando, can you please move to the English channel? Okay. I think there's a there's a button on the bottom of our screen. It's uh, it looks kind of like a world. Um, you have to click that. It's normally off, and if you click to English, it'll it'll get us over there. You're absolutely right. Thank you so yes. much, Al. It's yep. so for all of us in English, it's currently off. So just click on English. Thank you. Okay, Armand. Yes, Armand. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <sighs> <sighs> Thank you very much. Um, am, am I free to, to talk here? Do I have to flip over so our study can have my comments translated? We're good. Okay. Um, thank you for those those comments, Arcelli, um, and, and the kind words of the the programs that we've been offering. Um, definitely agree on the mental health and the social emotional aspect of the children that have been impacted by by the pandemic. Um, our team. Um, routinely assesses our program and has focused um, our training efforts of our staff on social emotional support within our after school programs and child care programs to, to start addressing um, those mental health and social emotional needs of the children. Um, as far as the, the sports leagues and sports programs, we are in discussions. Um, Unfortunately, our sports leagues have not been operating due to the pandemic, but we did have a grant in place uh, to make our team sports leagues free. Um, so we hope to get those teen sports leagues back up in action um, in the new year sometime. And um, for the foreseeable future, they will be um, free of charge um, at our teen center locations for those centers that, that do um, participate. So there's a bit of, of good news there. All right, thank you. Uh, next we have Claudia uh, Damiani. I, Mike, before we go on, I just want to make sure that it was interpreted into Spanish for our Sally. Katarina, I just want to make sure she was able to hear. Yes. Great. Perfect. All right, go ahead, Claudia. Thank you. So I want to thank everyone. Um, I'm very, I'm very pleased to see like all the different programs that are offered by the city. Um, my question is about a word that Jill said earlier, that she mentioned something about referrals. And I was wondering if there is a referral system that we can use as nonprofit organizations to connect our communities and the people that are coming to us with all these services that the city is providing. That would be all. That's a great point and something that we would definitely like to explore. Um, we did have a referral process set up um, for our uh, distance learning, learning pod program um, through the school districts. Um, 
but we would love to work with the nonprofit organizations uh, to set up a referral process for our programs, specifically our, our scholarship um, opportunities as well. So we are, are looking uh, to this task force um, to help us guide in setting something like that up. All right, thank you. Uh, next hand raised is Hugo Garcia. Thank you. Uh, wanted to mention, uh, you know, as a fellow out of school time uh, program, uh, San Jose Jazz uh, runs an after school music program in the Franklin McKinley School District. And one of the challenges that we have is um, having students trans transportation, right? Is, and, and having uh, youth be able to get to the programs that they want to attend and that the families uh, need so that they can continue working and, and, and all that. And so uh, I've been thinking about, and I just wanted to, to, to comment the idea of, of possibly working with uh, transportation department uh, VTA or or even the school district's own transportation departments, uh, San Jose Unified, Franklin McKinley, Alum Rock, um, and coming up with some kind of like a cohesive plan together that that students, uh, young, youth could get to uh, the community centers or could get to the parks or could get to after school programs that the nonprofits have, I mean, maybe at the Mexican Heritage Plaza or or with San Jose Jazz or wh whoever, right, wherever YMCA or or anybody. Um, but uh, just just trying to find a transportation solution. I know it's very complicated and complex, but I just think it's an issue that uh, for for many out of school time programs and childcare programs is 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 very um, is one of the main barriers of getting students uh, and helping families so their students can attend their programs. So if it's something we can come up with together, that might be something I propose as, as something we 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 talk about. Thank you. You know, I love I love that idea. Uh, transportation is definitely an issue. Um, the majority of our after school programs are held on school campuses just for that reason, right? Uh, parents do not have the opportunity to pick up their child and transport them somewhere else. We don't have access to, to buses or enough large vans to, to transport children from a school site to a community center. But if that was an option, we would be able to operate more after school programs because we know that that space at schools are precious and there's you know, a lot of other providers and competing priorities at schools. So um, space at schools can sometimes be tough. Uh, but if we were able to program out at a community center and get the kids there from school, it would be a huge benefit. So definitely open to having that discussion, hearing ideas, um, and hopefully come up with some solutions to for, for transportation. Thank you. And just another reminder that if you are a member of the public, uh, if you just hang on just a few more minutes, we will allow you public comment at the end of this meeting. And uh, you have two minutes to speak at that time. Thank you. All right, Rosalind, uh, back to you. Great. Um, well, again, thank you to all of the city staff um, for their presentations and thank you to the task force members for really good questions and comments. And we're really excited um, about the partnership that working together with you again in connecting um, these services to our residents who need them the most. So really do appreciate um, the discussion. So now, because in the interest of time, or I can't believe it's already five minutes to eight, um, we're going to the, go to the next portion um, of our meeting. Um, Aurelia is going to walk us through what we talked about um, at our last meeting, ideas around group agreements, um, and there were some suggestions by task force members. So Aurelia. Thanks, Rosalind. Um, yes, so like Rosalind said, we did spend some time last time we were all together and gave your input on how we're going to work together um, to really ensure that we feel we're heard, valued, and included. So you've seen the ones that's on the left-hand side. We will listen to understand, not to respond. We will respect diverse individuals and opinions. We will share the floor, allowing for others to speak and contribute. Just remember, there are 55 of you in this task force. So with all the different lived experiences and skills um, that everyone is able to share their views and that we, we will listen and give 
um, everybody a respect and vice versa. Uh, we will share the floor, allowing uh, for others to speak and contribute. We will, uh, at our meetings, one person will speak at a time. You guys have done that so, so good in the last two meetings. Uh, especially for our virtual meetings, we will use the hand the raise hand feature and wait to be called on. Uh, we will turn off our cell phones, not allow them to, to be a distraction to our meetings. So we did add a few other ones um, that you all have added, or not all, but I should say a few of you have added from our last meeting. Uh, we will help the visually impaired. We will share our name before we speak and with check and keep our comments at a reasonable pace. Um, we understand that no one knows everything, but together we know a lot. And then the last one that was added, we understand that others may not be as informed about a topic as we are, and we'll keep, and we'll make a space for questions to help them understand. Um, there's a lot of new topic that was talked about tonight and some acronyms that were thrown at you. And, there were a lot of great questions, so thank you for this conversation. Um, with that, I actually wanted to stop share because what we're gonna do now is that we would like uh, to take a, a vote on the group agreements either by raising your hand or you can, again, you can either raise your hand button or just simply raise your hand while we take the vote. And Aurelia, before we actually take that, that vote, we just want to make sure we want to have the space, right, to hear from task force members again. We reviewed these um, last meeting. We had some additions. We think they're good ones. Um, and we stand corrected because on one of the agreements, we didn't all, including myself, adhere to that to make sure that before we speak, identify who we are. I'm Rosalind Huey. Um, so we're going to practice that. So um, any comments, any further suggestions, any tweaks that need to be made, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Rosalind. Okay, so let us... Um, Sounds like we have, have consensus. <laughs> yeah, so if you don't have any comments, then let's... Um, by raising your hand, or you could either use the, again, the hand raise button. All right, great. Okay, well, Thank you everyone for participating in this and um, agreeing to the group agreements. So it looks like we have consensus. So we just um, want to sh speak with you just a couple of other things before we do go into public comment. Um, so just a few other um, items uh, in terms of what we heard in our last meeting. Um, we shared um, ideas about focus areas or pillars, whatever you want to call them. One was strengthening our families um, and the other was supporting small businesses. Um, there was task force discussion by a couple of members and, and others. Uh, the importance of also including uh, supporting workers and focus on workers. And so uh, we, we had a, a discussion about that. I think there was general consensus that made sense to do it. Obviously, we know many of our workers were severely impacted due to the pandemic. We heard comments tonight about those in the hospitality industry, those in healthcare. Um, and so we as staff have, have gone ahead and included that just in terms of, you know, these, these areas that we want, um, would like the task force to focus on. So again, would like to hear feedback or just get general consensus from, from everyone. And, and as you can tell in the presentations from our city staff this evening, you know, um, 
the the recovery initiatives really do focus you know on our families on children child care workforce development small businesses so this is clearly where um that this the city is is totally focused in so i there are probably leftover hands raised from the last question um are there are there any comments um on these three areas how about because I think there are a lot of leftover raised hands. If you want to just go ahead and unmute yourself, if, if you do have a comment, feel free to. All right, that's great. Sounds like we've got consensus around this as well. Um, also very quickly, just a reminder that we did provide um, summary notes of our last meeting, and we shared that in our email to you, and they're also posted to the recovery website. So whenever you want to go back uh, and to refer to those notes, if there's anything we missed, please feel free to email staff and, and we'll get that um, corrected. And then the last thing we did want to share with you about um, are ideas for forming committees or solution groups, whatever terminology we come up with, and, and the process for doing that. Um, and so we talked a little bit about that at the first meeting. Um, we as staff thought that that would be a good way for task force members to um, kind of go deeper into a particular topic or area of interest that you really like to focus on. We also think it's a way to bring in other community partners, other voices, particularly our own residents, right? Bring them into these conversations. Um, and so we propose that um, for our next meeting in January, that that will be um, our focus um, for that meeting. Um, if you have ideas, what we would like for you to do, if you have an idea about a committee, if you could, um, send an email to staff with that topic and maybe like a one sentence description. And then we're gonna compile all of those um, and hopefully get them out. What we receive, um, let's say a week before the next task force meeting, we will share that with the group. And then in January, we'll have a full discussion. And in fact, I think we'll devote that entire meeting um, to that discussion. Um, so uh, any any questions um, about that or any other suggestions about the process, about other ideas about forming those committees? Um, if there are topics that you have already been thinking about, now's the time to share with the entire group as well. Rosalind, this is Mimi from Prosperity Lab. So we send those ideas to Aurelia, am I thinking correctly? Um, if you could send them to the, we'll show the slide at the end of the meeting. It's our 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 task force email. Aurelia, can you maybe just go to that slide that shows the email address? There we go. So it's C E R C E R task force at San Jose CA.gov. Send it to that email address. Thank you, Rosalind, and thank you, Aurelia. Any other questions, comments? Arcelia, Sierra, do you have one? <laughs> sí, uh, la es para ver si lo entendí bien. Formar comités dentro de nosotros, las personas que estamos aquí, a los representantes, para trabajar más o menos en estas tres, um, tres cosas que están en la pantalla. Lo de fortalecimiento de familias, apoyo a los trabajadores. O es, me perdí poquito ahí, como qué nombre tenemos que mandar de comité si, si se nos viene a la mente. Como que está solo mandar un nombre y luego se dividirían esas cosas. de la pantalla 
So, los comités que vamos a formar, si los formamos en la siguiente reunión, van a ser para explorar un poquito más cada comité estos tres puntos o solo para hablar sobre cosas que podríamos incluir. Esa es mi pregunta. Yes, we can. Si están hablando, no se escucha. O yo no escucho. Yes. And so the, the idea is, you know, based on these three broader pillars or areas of focus, the idea is to come up of subsets or very particular topics. So, for example, when we say supporting workers, um, the idea may be about really focusing in on hospitality workers or healthcare workers. Um, another example is supporting small businesses. There might be an idea to really focus um, on those small businesses um, that are in the arts and perhaps partnering with our Office of Cultural Affairs to kind of go, you know, dive very deep into that particular area. So it's taking these broader um, areas and, and coming up with sub areas in essence. And so if you have, we don't want you to wait until the January meeting. So if you have an idea um, and it doesn't have to be fully baked out again, just what the topic is and a, a, a one sentence description, feel free to go ahead and email that to staff. And then what we'll do, we'll compile everything. And then at our January meeting, we can have a full discussion with everyone. Okay. Great, thank you, Arcelia. All right, any other questions? All right, so we'll now, we'll go right into our public comment portion of the meeting. I know we have a few members of the public that have been so patient um, and, and wanting to speak. So Mike, I'll again, go ahead and turn it over to you to call on those members of the public. All right, uh, Blair Beekman, you have two minutes to speak. Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I was going back and forth between this meeting and the Measure T uh, Public Oversight uh, Commission meeting that was also tonight. A hello to them and the work they do. Uh, a reminder, you should probably check them out. Uh, they, they provide an important service of uh, accountability practices to the future of uh, funding for highway projects and such. Um, I wanted to try to quickly comment that I heard, you know, some good words about the future of bridging the digital divide and digital, and digital equity issues. As important as those things are, and, uh, you know, we're trying to define good practices uh, for, this, for this commission, I hope I can introduce uh, the ideas of how open public policies and accountability with the technology that we'll be placing in local communities, the 4 and 5G, the smart street lights, um, all of that, if it has good open public policies and accountability ideas, if those practices learn to walk hand in hand and arm in arm with the important digital equity issues that we're working on, that's how I feel I feel you better build the com a community of innovation and, and trust and good practices. I think we're a bit wary in this era of COVID that I think open public policies and, and ideas of accountability with our technology, it adds an incredibly important uh, purpose to what we're doing with, with the needs of digital equity issues. There's two people from uh, Civic Innovation that are on this commission, it seems like. So, you know, it's important to have a well-rounded way to talk about uh, 
the future of uh, the technology we need in our community. And it, it builds, I think, really good practices. I think everyone, it's things that people can really enjoy a lot with open public policy ideas. Um, it's sustainable practices for our future. With eight seconds, good luck on how the commission process or the, the subcommittee process can be very open to, to all members of and persons of the public. Thank you. All right, and back to the staff. Great. Thank you, Blair, for your comments. Appreciate your attendance tonight and actually um, attending multiple meetings at once. Appreciate that. Um, so in terms of next steps, our next task force meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 13th. Again, it'll be a Zoom um, call at 6 p.m. Uh, you see our website there, our email address that you can email your ideas for committees. Uh, and then the staff also listed here. So our apologies for going over a little bit, but I think it was a really good discussion. We really appreciate your time, volunteering your time and your attendance um, and um, really just, just helping all of us, helping the city as a whole as, as we go and embark on this work together. Um, so with that, I, I'll staff, have I forgotten anything? Um, I think we can adjourn. Happy holidays to everyone. Hope you enjoy this season with family and friends. And we spent a little bit of time reflecting and getting ready for a brand new year. So thanks again. Good night, everybody.